staff, welcome to the Bird Conservancy of the Rockies and Nebraska Game and Parks Commission Women and Birds of Nebraska webinar. So this webinar is part of the first annual Nebraska Outdoor Women's Month, which is the entire month of March. So super excited to be a part of this wonderful event. And just as a reminder, please make sure that your video is off and your audio is muted. And we are also going to be recording this webinar and it will be posted on the Bird Conservancy of the Rockies YouTube channel at a later date. And so we'll get started if my PowerPoint decides to go. There we go. So uh, just as a reminder, I know we probably have been using Zoom a lot in the past year. You may already know this, but just a reminder, in the bottom left hand corner of your screen is your mute and video buttons. So please make sure there is a red slash through both the video and the mute at this time. And then if you're having any technical issues or difficulties, or if you have any questions throughout the webinar, please enter them through the chat. So you can see the chat button at the bottom center of your screen. We will have someone moderating the chat the entire webinar. So they'll, they'll be able to help you with any issues or any questions. And so Bird Conservancy of the Rockies is a nonprofit with the mission to conserve birds and their habitats through an integrated approach of science, education, and stewardship. And so our science team, they are the ones in the field gathering and collecting data on various birds and then analyzing this data in order to come up with some best practices in order to, to conserve our birds. And then our stewardship team takes all of this and uses this data and they're the ones working with landowners to help implement these best practices for birds and also for the landowners themselves. And then our education team, we're the ones who are going into schools, working with various family groups, adult groups, doing webinars like this. Um, in a variety of program to help inspire the next generation of stewards, ornithologists, scientists, and so forth. All this work together is to make sure that birds are around for generations to come. And this work is done throughout a variety of areas, all the way from the Rockies to the Great Plains, Mexico, and beyond. And so to introduce myself, I am Delaney Bruce. I am the Nebraska Wildlife Education Coordinator with Bird Conservancy of the Rockies. And also my favorite Nebraska bird as of today, because it's really hard to choose, is the burrowing owl. Also on our webinar, we have Jamie Bachman, a wildlife educator with the Nebraska Game and Parks Commission. Today, her favorite Nebraska bird is the Harris Sparrow. And then we also have Laura Smedzrud, wildlife education assistant with me out here in Scotts Bluff, Nebraska. And I unfortunately forgot to put it on this PowerPoint, but her favorite Nebraska bird species is the Western Meadowlark. And so now I'd like to get to know you all. So if you could open up your chat boxes and if you can let me know where you're from, how many people are watching with you, and then what your favorite Nebraska bird species is today or favorite bird that you've seen in Nebraska. And I say today because I know it can be really hard to narrow it down just to one favorite. Awesome, we have quite a few people from Lincoln, Sandhill Cranes, those are great. I love crane season. I really hope to make it down there sometime this year. Screech owls, awesome. A lot of Lincoln folks, that's great. We have Ponca, Ashland, Columbus. Wonderful, this is, ooh, Kansas, Illinois. I love that we're just not in Nebraska. This is fantastic. 
Who Swanson's Hawk? Cardinals, Red Wing Blackbirds. I know those are starting to come around more. I see them on the bird, the Cornell bird feeder cam all the time. Gearing, way to go, gearing representing Scotts Bluff Panhandle area, New Mexico. Nice. I like that we're all around the US now. Wonderful. So please keep all of these coming. Enter where you're from, how many people are with you and your favorite Nebraska bird or your favorite bird you've seen in Nebraska. And if you happen to not be in Nebraska, just enter your favorite bird from your home state. And so please keep this coming, go, keep coming as we keep go, moving on. Maybe. So why birds? Why care about birds? Why study birds? Just why birds? There are many reasons why we focus on birds, many more than the four we have here on the screen. First off, birds are in inspirational. From artwork to engineering, birds have inspired humans for ages. Also, birds are accessible no matter where you live, whether it's in the city, in the mountains, in the country, on a beach, on an island, you can always find birds. They may be different birds, but you'll always, no matter what, be able to find birds. They also provide a lot of ecosystem services, that, such as pest control and seed dispersal. I know if there was no birds, we'd have a lot more insects, pests flying around. So I do appreciate birds for that. And they are also major environmental it indicators. They are one of the first groups to be affected by environmental changes. And so birds are pretty special. And I am super excited to talk about some women who have done a lot with birds and bird conservation today. And so during this webinar, we will cover a very, very brief history of women in ornithology throughout the United States. And then we'll really dive deep and focus on honoring two Nebraska women who have made significant impacts in bird conservation, Mary Bomberger Brown and Mary Ann Lanigan. And we'll be able to have a panel discussion with some of Mary and Mary Ann's family, friends, and researchers and coworkers throughout the years. So first, before we get started, when you think of a conservationist, who comes to mind? And feel free to type that into the chat. See Aldo Leopold in there, yep. I know that's one that comes to mind. Rachel Carson, Michael Forsberg. I like that we have local people as well. Marion Lanigan. Awesome. I know when I think about this, I usually think about like famous conservationists. So people like Charles Darwin, Aldo Leopold, Rachel Carson, John Muir. And now let's narrow it down just a little bit. So when you think when you think of ornithologist, who comes to mind or bird conservationist, who comes to mind now? So we're narrowing down our focus a little bit. Audubon, Paul Johnsgard, J. Drew Lanham, Marion Landian. Awesome, I like all of this. Rachel Carson again. Fantastic. I know with me, I the number one name that comes to mind is John James Audubon. A few others are Alexander Wilson, William Clark, John Casson. And so there is a pretty common denominator with a lot of these is that they're mostly male. So what about the women? Well, they are definitely there and they have been there the entire time and they have played significant roles in ornithology and bird conservation throughout the years. 
And so we're going to cover a brief history of some of the unsung women in ornithology, only highlighting five of these women. And there are so many more out there. I wish I could cover them all, but it would honestly take me all night if we covered them all. And we only have an hour today. And so we're only going to cover, highlight a few of them. Our first one is Althea Sherman. She was an eccentric pioneer in the study of bird behavior. So she began her studies in her 50s at her Iowa, rural Iowa home. She converted her one acre home into a living laboratory to study chimney swifts. She specifically designed nest boxes and had her famous 28 foot chimney swift tower that she used to make those observations and also create the first detailed life history of chimney swifts. Next, we have Harriet Lawrence Hemingway and Mina Hall. These two women were cousins and were responsible for orchestrating the takedown of the 19th century plume trade. They persuaded family, friends, and other socialites to boycott the trade of feathers and birds for high fashion for hats. Instead, they had these women focus on supporting birds instead of using them for fashion. Their actions paved the way for the Massachusetts Audubon Society, which led to the establishment of the Nor National Association of Audubon Societies, the first bird conservation organization in North All right, I think you all can hear me again. And so the cedar waxwing pictured here was one of those common birds used in the plume trade back in the 19th century. And then we also have Florence Merriam Bailey. Florence authored The Birds Through an Opera Glass book, which is considered to be the first modern field guide to birds. She was also the first female member of the American Ornithologist Union and the first female to win the AOU's Brewster Award for her book, The Birds of New Mexico. Her field guides allowed people to learn how to ID birds without having to shoot birds, which is pretty good. And amongst all of this, she also played a very important role in passing the Lacey Act, which is, was passed in 1900 to ban wildlife tra trafficking. Finally, we have another Midwesterner. We have Frances Hammerstrom from Wisconsin. And she dedicated her life to researching and saving the greater prairie chicken from extinction, extinction in Wisconsin. She was one of the first people to use colored leg bands on wild birds, which has revealed invaluable information on bird behavior. Frances also worked, spent over 50 years studying birds with her husband and even studied under Aldo Leopold. She led and participated in many long-term raptor studies and pioneered the golden eagle captive breeding techniques. And one really cool fact that I just love about Frances is that she trained her first raptor at the young age of 12. I think that's pretty cool. And today, women are still making groundbreaking discoveries in ornithology. I chose one of those as the female bird song. There's many other studies and things that women are doing in ornithology. And so many female ornithologists have been studying female bird songs, which is essentially breaking the long accepted view that is that it is only the males that produce these long vocalizations or songs. And in a 2016 study that sampled 1,000 songbirds across the world, they found that 64% of these species had females that sing. And so this paradigm shift of studying female bird songs is being driven largely by women. 68% of female bird song papers 
have been by women recently. So I know I definitely look forward to more news and data coming to come out about female bird songs from more amazing women around the world. And I could honestly spend, there's many women in Nebraska doing work. There's many women in Bird Conservancy of the Rockies, Nebraska Game and Parks and across the United States. And I wish I could talk about all of them today, but we wanna to get to our main focus of this webinar is honoring two Nebraska women who have made significant impacts within bird conservation and environmental education within Nebraska. And that is Mary Baumberger Brown and Mary Ann Lan Langan. And so first off, and unfortunately I did not have the privilege or the opportunity to know either Mary or Mary Ann personally. So I will keep my introductions of them very brief and let our panelists introduce them much better than I ever could since they knew them, they have memories with them, they worked with them and so forth. So Mary Baumberger Brown was an ornithologist, conservation biologist, and behavior biologist with the University of Nebraska Lincoln. She also spent 20 plus years as a research associate on the long-term Cl Cliff Swallow Project where she developed a massive mark recapture data set containing over 400,000 data set captures and recaptures. And while she was also at UNL, she served as the coordinator for the Turn and Plover Conservation Partnership. Mary was also an advisor to many undergraduate, graduate, and postdoctoral students and mentored many, many field technicians over the years. She was a tireless supporter of young scientists, including supporting the Chimney Swift Club and after school program at the Irving Middle School in Lincoln. And then we also have Marianne, who had an 18 year career with the National Audubon Society, later becoming the executive director of Audubon Nebraska for five years. Marianne also played an instrumental role in the creation of the Education Center at Spring Creek Prairie, where she also became the first director for the center. As an avid environmental educator, Marianne facilitated inquiry-based nature education on a national level and also started programs such as the Prairie Immersion Program at Spring Creek Prairie, which introduced 1,300 Lincoln fourth graders to the tall grass prairie. In 2012, Marianne was invited to the White House Summit on Environmental Education. And Marianne also played a very important role and helped to grow Rose Sanctuary to be an internationally recognized birding hotspot. Marianne truly loved Nebraska and Mary and Marianne both leave behind legacies of conservation in Nebraska. And so now we're gonna get started with our panel discussion. So we have six panelists joining us throughout the today to share their memories and experiences and stories of Mary and Mary Ann. And so I am gonna stop sharing my screen now and we are gonna get them up so they can talk about Mary and Mary Ann. And so our panelists include Carl Wolf, Larkin Powell, Bill Tadikin, Amy Odin, Corinne Colm, and Melissa Panella. So we are, and then facil helping facilitate the discussion with myself, we also have Jamie Bachman. And so we are gonna get the discussion started in just a second. And so for our first discussion question, I would love if our panelists could all introduce themselves and also how, explain how you knew either Mary or Marianne or both of these women. And then for our audience, everyone else, if you have any questions throughout the discussion, feel free to post those into the chat and we will pick through those and periodically answer those throughout the discussion.
And so any one of our panelists can start us off. Okay, I'll start then. I knew Mary and Marion. Um, my name is Bill Taddeck and I'm the director at Audubon's Rose Sanctuary. But I was much more, I was much closer to Marion. Um, Marion was a close friend and really part of the family, uh, as well as a coworker. We worked together for a lot of years at Audubon. Um, and she was just a really special person and a great conservationist. Hi, this is Melissa Pinella. I'm the Wildlife Diversity Program Manager at Nebraska Game and Parks Commission. And I had the pleasure of knowing both of these wonderful women, working with both of them. I knew Marion because um, when I first started here in Nebraska and working with the Nebraska Natural Legacy Project, Marion served on the partnership team. And so um, I had a chance to work with her on different initiatives through that. And then I knew Mary, Mary actually helped hire me for my first job moving to Nebraska from Ohio. Um, and so I worked with her on the lease turn and pipe and clover conservation. Um, I had the chance to do field work with her, um, write reports and content for manuscripts. Um, and then also I was her associate editor years later for the Wilson Journal of Ornithology. So two great women and happy to be here tonight. I'm Larkin Powell at the School of Natural Resources at the University of Nebraska in Lincoln. And uh, I, knew, I knew both of them. I uh, had a great opportunities to, to be around Marion at uh, various meetings and um, conferences and such and um, work at, within Audubon. Um, she even freaked me out one day when I gave a presentation to the Omaha Audubon people. She asked if she could ride from Lincoln to Omaha with us and I didn't know that she was gonna be there and that really stressed me out about our talk that night. But um, I knew Mary the best. I. Um, met her out at Cedar Point Biological Station when I was teaching a class there in 2005, and she was doing the cliff swallow work. And um, kind of seeing her and the respect that people had for her developed this, uh, again, maybe it's like both of these people really kind of, uh, I, I was in awe of both of them because um, I just developed this sense that she was known nationally for her ornithology. And so it was great later when she had a, a little life change and moved to Lincoln to be a part of the School of Natural Resources to, to get to know her better and to be around her. Uh, my name's Corinne Collum. I knew Mary just a little bit, but I am Marianne Langen's daughter. I don't normally have this shrine that I just knocked down behind me, but uh, I thought it was appropriate for today. And just on behalf of my family, I'd like to thank the hosts for putting this on and um, everybody for being here and, and watching. It's really a lovely honor and tribute. So thank you. I guess I can go next. I am Amy Odin and I'm currently an environmental consultant out of Lincoln, Nebraska, but I was a graduate student and Mary Bomberger Brown was on my graduate committee. And not only did she help me out with my bird research, once I graduated, she kept in touch and she was an advisor way beyond school. And we became friends and had talks and she was a wonderful person to have in your life. We'll try it again. I'm, I'm Carl Wolf, and I live near Gibbon, Nebraska. Retired from Gaiman Parks after 40 years of work there. I knew both of the honorees, and it was a pleasure to know both of them. I probably knew Marion best because I started to work for her as a volunteer at the museum after I retired. And uh, so she deserves a heck of a lot of credit, not just for the work that she did with Audubon, but for the education work that she did at the museum. Mary, I knew from conferences more than anything else, but what a hard worker. So it's great that both of these people are being honored. They deserve it. Wonderful, thank you. So Jamie, I believe you have the next question. Thank you. 
So, uh, the panelists, what do you feel your uh, favorite project um, uh, of Mary or Marian's was? Some of you have already discussed it a little bit, but let's go into it just a little bit further. Um, Bill, would you like to start? Sure. So obviously, Spring Creek Prairie was a favorite project of Marion's. Um, she really, truly built that place from the grass up, so to speak. Um, but she was also, you know, very passionate about protecting tall grass prairie, um, and that was part of what they do at Spring Creek. Um, and in addition, she was super passionate about teaching people how to deliver quality inquiry-based education programs. Um, and she, her and Deb really changed the way nature education is done in Nebraska. Um, they got out of the way um, and introduced people to nature and children to nature in a way that um, really inspired learning. And so I would say those are two or three of the really most um, favorite things that Marion did in her career. Something that stands out to me that I remember Marion being very involved with was the idea of, you know, incorporating these various creative pursuits into conservation. So it's not just only about the science, you know, it's about the photography, the, the artistry of it, the poetry, the writing, um, music. And so making that emotional connection to nature and to birds and carrying that over into uh, really long lived conservation. So when people make those emotional connections, you know, they're, they're more likely to support conservation efforts throughout their lifetime. And, and I can remember Marian talking to me about that. And not only me, I mean, she would give presentations on this topic that I really enjoyed. So I think it was one that she um, enjoyed sharing with people. I'll add on to that just a little bit. Um, on, a, on a personal note of what a uh, favorite part of my mom's job was, which probably most of you don't know, um, when they were building the education center out at Spring Creek, they you know put a lot of work into gr getting green building materials and um, repurposing things. But that's a fancy term for the fact that my mom and Deb Hoswald, the former education, um, Bill's already laughing because he knows what I'm gonna say, the former education coordinator out there, they went thrifting and garage sailing like crazy to get materials to outfit that building because they were working on a shoestring budget. They both loved treasure hunting and the creativity that went into finding something that just kind of looks like a piece of junk. And then all of a sudden it's an old chalkboard that they turned into a counter or uh, old farm equipment that becomes part of the decoration, the gift center, all these sort of things. So no matter where we went on vacation, anywhere, my mom was stopping and like, oh, there are cheap office supplies. I need to buy those for the prairie. I mean, half of that, half of what is in that education center is probably from thrift stores and, and garage sales, I would say. So um, she really took a lot of pleasure out of that because it was both, you know, reusing things and saving the environment and then also saving money so they could direct it towards more conservation activities. So she actually really, really loved doing that. I think, I think, Go ahead, Carl. I think I recall a number, a number of times when Marion arrived late at night. She stayed with us quite a bit when she was out here. And uh, I particularly remember one of the mud years, probably the first one, uh, trying to traverse Bill Tadikin's famous El Elm Island Road. And she arrived pretty late, full of mud, she said something that wasn't really in keeping what Marion usually said about things, but she wasn't happy because she almost didn't make it here. We live about a mile as the crow flies from uh, what used to be the straw bale blind at Rowe. Uh, but we see that blind when we turn into our driveway. But at any rate, Marion arrived well after midnight and uh, she indicated that 
this was an almost didn't make it trip. And uh, that's the first time I think I've ever heard Marion say anything that anybody could come close to saying was a real cuss word. But uh, the mud was an impediment, obviously. And I think she mentioned Bill's name in regard to the road. <laughs> but at any rate, we enjoyed Marion here a lot. And I know she enjoyed staying here uh, because she made it sort of her home place, her office when she was out here. And there wasn't a guest we would rather have than, than Marion when she was here. That's not fair because it's not my road, but I do get blamed <laughs> for it a lot. I know. <laughs> I'd, I'd say from Mary Baumberger Brown's standpoint, it's hard to point to, like, I can't imagine her uh, being able to answer the question of what her favorite project was that she worked on because she did the Cliff Swallow work, which had a, a very long history. Um, I think now it's in its 30 something year of uh, history of work and um, the largest mark recapture data set when they banned the legs of the cliff swallows. Um, it's the largest mark recapture data set in uh, at least North America. Um, the, uh, and so that's a, obviously an important project in her life. The, the turns and plovers, you know, she, I think she was responsible for kind of personalizing those birds to a lot of people and showing, showing um, her, her little buddies, as she called them, to, to people. And so I know she loved working on that project when she came here to Lincoln. And, um, you know, she and I worked together on a really impactful prairie chicken project together, too, that was a lot of fun. But I would say, you know, if I would say what I saw is maybe some of the things that she got the most excited about were actually some projects with people. And you mentioned, um, Delaney, the, the project at Irving School with the cliff, uh, with, sorry, with the chimney swifts. Um, she really, I, I didn't realize, and I talked to her almost every day, I didn't realize the depth of time that she was spending with those middle school kids. Um, and she worked with Michael Forsberg to have some pictures and imagery taken there. Um, and then in our School of Natural Resources, I know she just got a huge charge out of the fact that she worked with our grad students to, to develop the women in science, American women in science chapter that first started in the School of Natural Resources, but quickly expanded to the university level. And I think that just uh, really kind of knocked her socks off to think that um, she, and that was basically motivating graduate students and undergraduate students to, uh, to, to push that effort forward. And, and those things just really um, were inspirational to watch. Wonderful, thank you. I definitely enjoy learning more about both of these women. And we kind of, with that question, we kind of touched on the next one. So if any of you have anything more to add, feel free to, if not, we can move on to the next one. But we have, what do you remember Mary or Marianne enjoying the most about their work? And I know we kind of touched on this with their favorite project, but if anyone has anything else to add to that. Well, I know Marion. Oh, go ahead, Bill. I'm sorry. I know Marion loved to see the light bulb turn on in children as they were talking about nature and teaching about nature. And um, she, she was a lifelong learner. And I don't think she ever went through a whole a day where she didn't learn something. And so learning was another really big, important thing in her life. And I, I cannot even imagine how much she read because she was always reading two books or three books at a time um, and learning something. I was just going to say, you know, reminiscing about some of my field work days with Mary, um, you know, we would be out there and she would comment how we have to like think like the birds, you know, where do they want to go? Where do they want to build their nests? And, um, you know, she would just always have so much fun with it. And so then that would really, you know, get her uh, field associates excited about it too. And, and she was so good at handling, you know, catching and then handling these little birds and getting bands on them and doing everything just right. And then teaching us how to do that too. So um, I think she really enjoyed that aspect of her work. I might add on to that. I did not get to work with Mary on the turns and plovers, but I know quite a few people who did. And it sounds like 
the field work aspect of that that they got to go through with her as she taught them and was handling the birds was probably some of the best times of those people's lives. And I'm jealous that they had that opportunity to be out there on the sandbars with her. I know if, if we asked my mom this, I'm quite sure she would say that it was their relationships that she built over the years because some of her closest friends were coworkers. And I mean, Carl mentioned volunteers. Um, so really those relationships were incredible. And then taking that further to just uh, help foster people's relationships with nature. Because like Melissa said, my mom very much felt that people can have the facts and a scientific understanding and all of this, but it doesn't necessarily motivate them to care, to love something. And that's where their relationship came in, particularly with kids in nature, also adults in nature, is if you can help instill an appreciation and love that relationship, then people will actually want to preserve something. So I think the relationship in general with her work, and she always said that she met the coolest people always through conferences and travel and volunteers out of the prairie and at Roe. She just felt like she was surrounded by really, really good people. I would hope, I would hope that at some point before we leave, uh, this program that people would realize that both of these honorees were beacons, beacons to young conservationists, particularly young women. And I hope that those of those that are in the young woman category tonight that are watching uh, take this to heart because the things that both Mary and Marion possessed were the abilities that a lot of people don't have. Uh, one of these was being able to write. The other one was to speak. Uh, and particularly for Marianne, she brought a new light to the ways of negotiating because that's what she basically had to do as director for Audubon, Nebraska. But she was especially good at that. She was non-confrontational, but she had a way of uh, not telling people what to think but somehow mesmerizing them into how to think. And that's where most of the negotiation process always comes in, uh, teaching people how, how to think and how to think about things that may be controversial. So Marion in herself was very successful as a negotiator and she did an excellent job in that regard. And like I say, any young woman conservationist that happens to be looking at this program needs to look at those qualities and say, these are things that are needed more than anything else in the field. How do I do them? And I hope that's where Larkin comes in uh, to be able to extol some of those properties and make those qualities available to students so they learn how to do these things that are so important. It isn't just academics, it's how you work with other people, because that's what conservation is all about, particularly with wildlife. It's more politics than it is biology very often. I'd, I'd agree, Carl, and I think uh, one of the legacies that uh, Mary left uh, us with at the university and just uh, among all of her colleagues was her model of how to mentor students and um, how to um, to seek out the student that might have been the quiet student in the second row or something of class and um, I don't think she ever advertised her summer technician positions with the turn and plover um, partnership as an example I think I think she uh, approached people that she thought could use that first experience. And so she didn't, she wasn't advertising this position, expecting somebody with three years of experience to apply. So she had the best turn and plover monitor known to humankind. Uh, she was seeking those people out. And I would say 80% um, of them over the years were young women um, so that she could do her job in fostering that part of our profession. Um, and being inclusive that way, and, and she would um, give them the training. And that's actually the focus of the last um, NET grant that she 
received before she passed away um, was to, to use the Turnip Clover Partnership as a mentoring um, service, essentially, to train people how to do conservation biology um, and go out and contribute to the, to the world. And if you look at the year, I, I saw a poster once at their 25th anniversary of the Quick Cliff Swallow Project. They had the, 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 the crew photos for every year since the project began. Uh, and here, uh, Mary and Charles are getting older and older, but you know the kids are always the same. <laughs> the students are always the same age. But um, if you looked at that again, like 80 to 90% of those um, young women and uh, you can point to, or she would, uh, she would make you listen to stories about how this person now was doing a postdoc at Princeton, and this person was doing this, and that person was doing that. She had success stories. That's great. Um, does anybody have a would like to share a a story or a personal experience of how Mary or Marion uh, um, impacted your life? You know, personal. Let's let's do it. Let's get into it. Who wants to go first? Okay, I'll start. Um, <laughs> I have so many memories of Marion. Um, she was a great friend and a mentor. She was a, close to my entire family and meant the world to my wife and my daughter as well. Um, my daughter loved to have Marion come to stay with us because she treated Aurora like she was the most special person. And in addition, we always got a box of sugary cereal when Marion was coming because Marion liked that stuff. My daughter didn't get it when Marion wasn't around. But Marion was so special in so many ways and her influence on me and my work is just really too vast to, to really explain. And I've discovered that I'm still learning from her in ways I'd never have been imagined um, even today. So she was very special. I would say I had, you know, personal life changing experiences um, because of Marion and Mary. So with Marion, it was, um, you know, I was looking to move to Lincoln. I had like an hour commute to work and my kids were very young. Um, but it seemed like a big idea to try to relocate, even though I worked in Lincoln because I had a house to sell and it wasn't at a time when houses were just, you know, flying off the market like they are now. I wasn't going to make any money on the house. It's expensive to move. Um, and so I had a conversation with Mary and, and she was just telling me, you know, you, you just got to make up your mind. You can do this and, and you'll figure out a way and, you know, set a date and, and sure enough, you know, it all worked out. I got relocated to Lincoln and I was able to save so much time not having to commute, more time with my kids. They could do extracurricular stuff then. I can drive them back and forth. And Marion was able to come to my housewarming party. So, um, so I, you know, I'm grateful to her for that, for just, you know, she was just one of those, you got to go after it, you got to make a plan and do it. Um, with Mary, you know, Mary approached me when she was going to take on the Wilson Journal of Ornithology as the, the first female editor. And um, she wanted me to be her associate editor. And that came at a time in my life when I could really use that extra work. And it just seemed like an amazing opportunity. It was a big idea to think that we were going to do this. And she said, you know, we're going to be the first all female ornithological editorial team. And I was just amazed by that, that, um, you know, she's was very, obviously Mary's very bright, very well published and, and that she chose me for this. And we just, you know, we went after it and through Mary's leadership, I mean, that journal took on more publications per issue. Um, she's got so many new authors published, you know, she increased the relevancy of the journal. Um, so, you know, both of them had life changing um, or helped bring life changing experiences in for, for me. So I'm grateful to both of them. I, I would say that um, the the last lesson that both these ladies left with me um, 
and a you know an elephant in the room is that uh, we're we were shorted on contributions that that both of these professionals could have given to us because they left us earlier than maybe uh, one would want. And so I think in their own ways, they both shared with us how to um, not leave things on the table and to and to do things um, in the moment and to do and to to get things done and and um, and really move forward and, and make a contribution when you can. Um, because one doesn't know what the what the future brings, and I think that's the the last lesson. I, I know that I still find myself. Uh, there's phrases like you know it is what it is, um, the uh, or think like a bird. Um, the like was said earlier that um, that I think I I find myself using that uh, Mary has left with me too. So uh, I've got vocabulary from at least her. I'd like to just add that there's some really great um, stories being shared in the chat too about each of these wonderful women. So might wanna peruse. Of course, thank you all for sharing. Um, and that's a good segue to Laura. Is there any questions in the chat that people in the audience have for our panelists today? We don't have any questions like Jamie was saying. There are some nice little memories that people are sharing. I think one of them is they knew Mary through cycling. Um, there was a story where Mary was, let me see. Marion was driving around in a four seat golf cart with three older gentlemen. And when she saw the guest who typed the story, she slammed on the brakes, hopped up and wanted to know who these special people were. And the people in the golf cart ended up being the governors of Nebraska, Colorado and Wyoming. So she made everyone feel special. And then, yep, commenting on the legacy that she left with uh, the Association for Women in Science at UNL. And Marilyn Tabor said that both of these women showed me insights into listening to diverse opinions, asking questions, and following up as people with different backgrounds, backgrounds, quote, saw the light. Their discrete methods opened a lot of doors for successful projects in Nebraska. So lots of fond stories, not too many questions. I remember my first experience and getting to know Mary was um, one of the very first years I worked at Rose Sanctuary, we went out to do a banding operation on cliff swallows, and we were going to try to band them from a highway bridge. And so we had, I don't know, maybe a dozen people there, and we were working through all the logistics, and we were going to walk out on the bridge with this mist net and tip it over the edge and count to 10 and bring it back up. And we were only gonna get like five or 10 birds because we wanted to practice. Um, so the guys went out on the bridge and they tipped the net down and within two seconds, they brought the net back up and we had 39 cliff swallows in the net and only one experienced bander in the group and no birds died, no birds got hurt. We got them all banded, but it was one of those experiences like, oh my gosh, what have we done? Um, and that was all for Mary's project. So, and John Dynan was one of the biologists and he's gone now too, but um, he was one of the guys operating the net and the look on John's face was priceless. Awesome. So I know one thing I'll mention is just, you know, as successful as both of these women were and very intelligent, they both were always so humble that, you know, I mean, if anybody were to just look at their resumes and hear about them, they might initially be intimidated. But once you, you know, sit, sat down with them and had a conversation, you just realized how down to earth each of and approachable each one of these women were. And, um, and that's why I think they were just so great at their jobs and mentoring and reaching out to um, young women in particular and kids. So it looks like we have a question from the chat from Sarah 
of how could individuals support the memories of these special ladies? You know, um, because Marion was so passionate about youth leadership, um, Audubon and her friends and relatives created and funded the Marion Langen Young Leaders Program at Audubon. Um, we have two young women who last year went through the program and now they're both working full-time for both Spring Creek and Rose Sanctuary. Um, very amazing young women. We have a new one this year out of Texas um, here at Rose, who's also going to be amazing. And so, you know, that would be a nice way to continue to commemorate Marion is to continue to help fund that young leaders program. Thank you for including that link to the scholarship, Larkin. That's in the chat if anyone would like more information. And that's a that's a fund that Mary established as part of her estate when she left and others have continued to contribute to that in the last couple of years. So I, we're, we're running, running to the end here. I, I, I thought another good question, um, Delaney, if you don't mind, is, is the, the advice, do you have any that, remember any advice that Mary or Marion had, has, had given you um, and to, to share? Well, I'll throw out something that my, my mom kind of struggled to teach me and I'm only kind of now getting it. But I remember uh, one time an ambulance went by and I made an offhand comment about, um, oh no, someone's hurt or sick and I always feel bad when I see an ambulance or so something like that. And my mom said, well, you can, you can look at it that way, but I mean, also, don't you just feel so good knowing that we live in a place and an era where people can get help, you know, because that's what ha is happening. They're getting help. And that sort of mindset was something that she cultivated in herself. And it's, you know, kind of cliche um, focus on the positives, but uh, it really made a difference. And I can tell you from having go gone through her illness, I mean, she just grabbed onto all the positive things that she possibly could and like really was very graceful in getting ill and the dying process and all of that because she chose to focus her attention to the things that brought value to her life. And I think as, you know, conservationists, it's really necessary to, to do that because it's easy to get discouraged if you you know, choose to focus on all of the problems, all the negatives, all the challenges, but there are so, so many good things everywhere. And so um, I'm, I'm trying to always remember that as well. It's something that, that I work on, but my mom was a firm believer in mindset, really, you know, setting the direction for your life or as she called it framing. It's just how you frame things. So, yeah. One of, one of Mary's phrases that I always liked was that uh, the birds can't talk, so we have to talk for them. And a lot of that was focused around how we um, that do research have to use the, the, we have to tell stories about our data and make sure that people understand those stories. And, and we have to talk uh, for the birds um, as the, as the um, and we have to tell the stories that the birds would tell if they were the ones telling it. So we can't stretch the truth or try to bend it to the way that we might want to uh, bias this, you know, for our purposes, that uh, we have to tell the story that the birds would tell. There's a nice comment in the chat here from an autumn Tatican. Saying Marion would say never give up. She talked always about moving things one pebble at a time. All right. I know we are nearing the end of our time, and I have thoroughly enjoyed 
hearing all the stories and the memories of both Mary and Marianne, and it makes me just wish I knew them when they were here. Um, but I do appreciate all of you joining to share all of these wonderful things and qualities about both of them. Um, it was really inspiring. Um, and I, ju I just wish I knew them and I'd love to hear more about both of them one day. And I wish we could keep going and keep this conversation going all night, but I wanna be cognizant of everyone's time and thank all of my panelists for joining and sharing everything and thank everyone in the Zoom for joining and learning more and sharing your stories of Mary and Marianne. Um, and yeah, any final comments, memories, stories from our panelists before we all say goodbye for the night? I'm just really glad that, you know, Delaney, you pulled this together and Jamie yeah. and everybody who helped with this. And I'm glad it was recorded because I'm seeing so many things popping up in the chat, so many stories that I want to read later. I can't keep up with them all right now on my screen, but um, thank you for this. Yes, thank you. Does the chat record? So the chat is being saved. I can send out copies of the chat to everyone. I don't believe it's being recorded on this actual screen, um, but I will send out copies so that way everyone has can read up on the various stories and everything. Cause yeah, I know I've had trouble. I'm like, I can't keep up. I can't wait to go back and look at all of these in the chat too. I did get a request to uh, talk more about who we are as Bird Conservancy of the Rockies. Yeah, so we are a nonprofit. So we work all throughout um, the Great Plains, all the way from Montana to the Rockies to Nebraska down to Northern Mexico. And so we focus on conserving birds and their habitat through stewardship, science, and education. And so we do various programming and research throughout uh, the Great Plains and the Rockies. And I know we do say we are Bird Conservancy of the Rockies, but we are found in Nebraska. We are located, our Nebraska office is in Scotts Bluff. And so we do various education programs out here in the Panhandle and we have a biologist in Chadron as well, Chelsea Forehead, and she is doing wonderful work with landowners up there. And then in Larkin, did you have something else to say? I saw you were talking earlier, but you were muted. I was responding to my wife to oh, a comment that was in the chat that Mary would say, this has been the bee's knees. And that's a, I had forgotten that she used that phrase and I just thought that was awesome. So thanks to Chris Thode. Wonderful. Well, thank you all for joining. Thank you again to our panelists for joining. Uh, this is the end of our webinar. This is being recorded and it will go up on the Bird Conservancy of the Rockies YouTube channel. I will be sure to send out a specific chat or a specific email with the chat to everyone so that way they can read all of the stories and memories that were in there. And in that email, I will have a very, very short evaluation of the webinar just to get your feedback on how it went, how you liked it, and any recommendations for the future. And we will be sure to include the links as well to the Marian Memorial Fund. And I know Larkin also shared the Mary Bomberger Brown Scholarship Fund as well in the post email. So thank you all for joining. And we thank you so much panelists. That was really amazing to hear all the stories. Thank you so much for joining. Thanks everybody for being here. Thank you. Keep up the good work, everybody. Awesome. Thank you, and I hope everyone has a great rest of their evening.